So the internet law program is in part a program about how cyberspace gets regulated. And in this lecture, we set a framework for thinking about regulation in the context of cyberspace that builds upon insights that have been developed about the way cyberspace is architected and the way law interacts with that architecture to affect certain important regulations. Now, in the beginning of cyberspace and the talk about cyberspace as a place of social behavior, there was a certain particularly important and pronounced view about whether cyberspace could be regulated or how the government might interact with cyberspace. And in that beginning, that view was that cyberspace would be unregulable. Now, this view was advanced by certain important and brilliant contributors to the early debate. This is John Gilmore, who early on said that the net would interpret censorship as damage and simply route around it. Or John Perry Barlow, who was one of the famous early founders of rhetoric around what we call net libertarianism. Here's his Declaration of Independence for cyberspace. Governments of the world you weary giants of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. Now, the puzzle about this early view was that if government can't regulate cyberspace, then why were so many people obsessed and worried about the way government might, in fact, regulate cyberspace? And our view is that the worry betrayed an understanding that many of these people had from the very beginning. And that was that there was, in fact, a way that the government might interact with cyberspace to affect its regulation, and that we needed to understand at least this mode of interaction if we were to defend values that were important and to protect ideals that we needed cyberspace to assure. So let's see a picture of how, in fact, cyberspace is regulated, or how we might think about the interaction between legislative policy and the architecture of cyberspace. Now, I begin by just setting up a framework of the things that typically are involved in regulation what I call what things regulate, as a way to understand something more general than what lawyers typically understand when they think about the nature of regulation. So in the center of this picture is the pathetic red dot, this target of regulation, which will be the subject of the analysis which we present here. The target of this regulation the red dot is obviously, and as lawyers think, primarily regulated by the law. And the law regulates that red dot by stating rules, like the rule that says you may only drive 70 miles per hour. Those rules are stated before behavior is to occur. They are ex ante rules. And they threaten an ex post punishment. That punishment imposed by the state is a way for the state to create incentives for people to comply with the rules. Now, ex ante just means that the rules have to be stated before the fact. And ex post, of course, is that the punishment is applied after you've broken the rule. But the ex ante rule that's enforced by the state is the paradigm of regulation, again, as lawyers think about it primarily. But in addition to the law as an effective regulator, there are many other regulators that affect how people behave. Probably the most important in many societies is the way that norms regulate behavior. The norms of a society will impose rules on individuals within that society about how they must behave or what their behavior with respect to other individuals must be. Those rules are governed not so much by strict absolute requirements, but often are governed by understandings of members within a community. So when you're driving on a highway, you might have an understanding to pull to the side to avoid a certain kind of interaction with other cars on the highway. Those rules are not so much imposed by the state. They might instead be understandings that people have in the context of highway driving or in the context of just walking on a sidewalk. 
Now, those rules are also ex ante rules in the sense that we understand whether implicitly or explicitly what these rules require. And they are punished, again, after the fact, ex post. But now the punishment is imposed by, this, by the neighbors in your community, not so much by the state. So when you deviate from a requirement of a norm, you feel a certain punishment. And for many people, it might be even more significant than the punishments imposed by the state. But the punishment gets imposed by people within the society and not by organized governments that enforce or require the behavior that the norm supports. A third kind of regulator functions differently and is also important uh, and should be thought of as a distinct modality of regulation, too. This is the regulation of the market. The market sets conditions on which you're allowed to interact with others through property and contract. These conditions set, for example, prices that establish the relationship between the amount of one good that you get in exchange for another. So they set the relationship between, for example, how many hours you have to work in order to afford your rent every month, or how many hours you have to work in order to afford to go to university. These conditions are set in a competitive market as the sum of many individual decisions across the market. They are simultaneously imposed as a price. So for example, here in California, we have to pay somewhere up to $2.50 a gallon for gasoline. That's a condition on the ability to get access to gasoline that regulates our ability to drive cars easily. If the price were lower, people would feel freer to drive cars in California. If the price were significantly higher, they would be more constrained. Now, this constraint functions as a simultaneous condition on people's ability to get access to resources. And it's enforced by people within the system of the market. That market itself, of course, is constructed against the background of a set of legal regulations and against the background of a set of moral or norm regulations. The law establishes the rule for contract and property. And norms establish what sorts of things one's allowed to trade in the market. So these things aren't totally separate. They overlap in important ways. But the market functions, in this sense, differently from how norms or law function. Finally, and most importantly, in thinking about the way cyberspace will be regulated, is the regulation of what I'm calling architecture. Now, by architecture, I mean the way in which we find the world or the physical space within which we find ourselves, even if the way we find the world has been constructed by individuals, not just by nature, these constructions impose constraints on our freedom. And those constraints are, in many senses, a kind of regulation. So your car is regulated by the law in its statement that you can only travel at 70 miles per hour. But the architecture of the car might be regulated such that its maximum speed, significantly higher than 70 miles per hour, still is a maximum speed, perhaps a speed of 160 miles per hour. That, like the market, is a simultaneous condition or constraint in the sense that it's not like the Roadrunner uh, uh, cartoons, where one races off the edge of the cliff and then subsequently falls. The constraint of gravity in real space, not cartoon space, is simultaneous with the behavior. Um, but it's enforced not by people, but by nature. And that enforcing uh, or enforced uh, constraint is, in the scheme which we will discuss here today, uh, also an important part of regulation. Now, the map that I've provided that adds together the regulations affected by architecture and by the market and by norms and by law tends to belittle law, because law is now just one of four regulations. And the important insight to uh, reinforce the position of lawyers, and I, of course, produce lawyers for a living, so I'm eager to make lawyers feel like they continue to have an important role in this story, uh, 
is that of these four regulations or modalities of regulation, the law has an important role in affecting these other modalities. The law affects things that regulate. So let's go back to our picture of the pathetic dot. The law can be used to transform norms, and those norms then transformed will regulate behavior differently. The law can be used to change the constraints of the market so that the market will then regulate differently. And the law can be used to change the constraints of architecture so that architecture will regulate differently. Let's take a particular example, quite salient here in California, where I now teach. This is the example of smoking. In California, there are rules, some federal, some state, that regulate by law who can smoke. So for example, you must be over 18 to buy cigarettes. In addition to those rules, we have certain norms that have in part been constructed by advertisements that the law has through the government supported. So advertisements that try to convey the idea that smoking kills or that smoking is unhealthy or that smoking goes with a certain lifestyle that is stigmatized. All of those efforts at propaganda to change how people think about people who smoke are efforts by the state to change the norms and the way the norms constrain individuals' ability to engage in the behavior of smoking. In addition to norms, we also have government efforts to change the cost of smoking through taxes, for example, that raise the cost of cigarettes significantly, and by raising the cost, reducing the demand for cigarettes. Of course, inconsistently, in the United States, we both subsidize tobacco and tax cigarettes, so it's not as if the government's necessarily consistent, but the point is the government has a lever through the market to restrict the access or the demand for cigarettes. And finally, the government has at various moments in its history contemplated regulating the architecture of cigarettes to reduce the demand for cigarettes by reducing the addictiveness of cigarettes. So in the Clinton administration, the FDA considered regulating a cigarette as a nicotine delivery device. And by regulating it as a nicotine delivery device, they would reduce the amount of nicotine within a cigarette and if you reduce the nicotine in a cigarette and changed the architecture to make it less addictive, you could make it easier for people to choose not to smoke if, in fact, that was their preference. Now, this th fourth conception of architecture as a regulator is the one that we will focus on in the context of cyberspace, but is, a, is the one that's least familiar. And it's least familiar especially in the context of real space regulation. And so I want some, you to consider some examples just to make it clear that the kind of regulation we're talking about here with architecture is not totally new to cyberspace. So for example, Napoleon III, who was a tyrant running uh, Paris, uh, regulated Paris in a certain way by regulating the architecture of Paris. Napoleon III didn't like the fact that it was very easy for revolutionaries to bring Paris to a standstill because the back roads make it e made it easy for them to create barricades that would block the access of Parisians to various parts of the city. And blocking access of Parisians made it easy for the revolutionaries to make demands that the government had to respond to. So Napoleon III's response to this dynamic was to rebuild Paris with very broad boulevards. Those broad boulevards would make it very hard for a revolutionary force to affect any revolutionary uh, uh, strike within Paris, because to block a boulevard requires much greater effort than just a small street. And so in this way, Napoleon was able to change the architecture of Paris to make it easier to regulate Parisians. A second example, which is a little bit uh, uh, unfamiliar and uh, a lot embarrassing to the history of the United States, is the example of Robert Moses, who was a public administrator in New York. Uh, during the time when segregation continued to be a popular public policy uh, 
even though the Supreme Court of the United States had declared segregation inconsistent with the requirements of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. So Robert Moses was in, in, in responsible for public works programs. And as part of his responsibility, he had the ability to design the way roads and bridges were constructed. And he used that power to make it so that people would, quote, naturally choose to segregate themselves when they went to public beaches. And the way he did this was to build bridges over certain roads very low so that buses could not pass on those roads. And that meant that people who relied upon public transportation could not get to the beaches on the other side of those bridges. And because the income distribution was skewed in favor of white people and against immigrants and, and uh, African Americans, that meant that only white people could easily get to those particular beaches and immigrants and African Americans would have to go to other beaches. Well, this tipped the balance of the beaches such that the beaches were, in this sense, naturally segregated. But of course, <coughs> it wasn't nature that was segregating the beaches. Instead, it was the design that Robert Moses had effected for the way the roads and highways and bridges interacted. And finally, and not as depressing as that example, is the example of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was a statute passed by Congress designed to re-architect the way many public and uh, important commercial buildings were constructed. Uh, if you were a person who experiences the world in a uh, wheelchair, you would consistently have the sense of how architecture is a regulator of you because when you confronted stairs, you would recognize that these stairs blocked your ability to gain access to certain facilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act made it so that builders of buildings and built people reconstructing buildings would have to build those buildings so that the architecture was no longer a barrier to the involvement of people with handicaps to public uh, uh, life and so that the architecture was no longer a constraint for them. This is a self-conscious effort to change architecture, to change the ability of people to participate in important aspects of public life. So architecture has long been a regulator. Architecture is an important regulator in the context of real space regulation. But our focus today is on cyberspace and the regulation in cyberspace. Now cyberspace is itself just an architecture. It is a set of technologies that through software and hardware embed in its design certain capabilities and disable certain other capabilities. It is an architecture which was built to facilitate a certain kind of communication and it has facilitated because of its end-to-end -end design many types of interactions that were never originally intended. But that design is the function of certain choices made by the original network architecture uh, architects. The original uh, core suite of protocols that built this architecture is typically referred to as the TCP IP protocols. That's a name that collects within its uh, 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 intended scope a range of protocols that facilitate different functionalities that we now associate with the internet. Um, at its core, the very beginning of this protocol was simply a protocol for facilitating the shipment of data across a network. Uh, and that shipment can be captured in a graphical form in this example that I'm presenting on the screen. If you start with an email message, what the TCP IP protocol does is first decide how to carve the message up into packets of data. And then those packets of data are then marked with a header, and the header information includes an address on the network called an IP address. The internet protocol address is a logical location on the internet to which each of these packets of data will travel. So once the packets of data have been identified with this header information, they're then spit out onto the network. 
And each packet, conceptually, could pack pass in a totally different way as it worked its way across the internet to the intended recipient of the email message. Now, once the email message is received in these packets at the other end of the communication, then the packets are reassembled into the email, and then the email appears on the computer uh, uh, clients of the intended recipient. Now, the important point is to recognize that certain things follow from this architectural design. Certain important facts about the ability to regulate or the ability to control what people do in this particular network. And I'm going to simplify those, but here's the core of what follows from that design. You can't know, because of this design, necessarily who it is who is spending the packets across the internet. You can't know from the early version of this design essentially what the packets of data are because they're just wrapped in an envelope and marked with a, an address. And you can't really know where the packets are going from the simple TCP IP protocol design itself because the IP addresses, as I said, are just logical locations on the internet. They have no necessary connection to any particular geographical location. So from the perspective of the data which is conveyed automatically to a user in the context of a communication across the internet, we can't know who the person sending the data is, what the data is that they're sending, or where the data is going, or more um, uh, precisely, if you were just watching the data going across the network, you, the third party snoop, couldn't necessarily know who, what, or where this data was uh, affiliated. This produces what we can call a kind of relative anonymity in life in cyberspace. Not absolute anonymity, because there are techniques to learn who someone is, or where they come from, or what the data is that they're sending. But relative anonymity in the sense that the system or the architecture does not self or automatically produce information about this inform this, these facts which might be necessary to identify people or places or the activity being engaged in. And therefore, relative anonymity means it's relatively difficult to regulate for the government. And secondly, and in different, uh, for different reasons, but just as important, it's very difficult for commerce on this existing first architecture of the internet to uh, regulate commercial behavior, or what I call marculate, like regulate, in the sense that it's difficult for the commercial entities to engage in commerce with people at the other end of the network if they can't know who those people are or, what, uh, or where they come from, because those facts are at least necessary to be able to engage in a commercial transaction. So that's the idea here of regulation. And one first important point that follows from this is to understand that these features of this original internet, these features of um, the way the internet was and what follows from the way the internet uh, was, are not necessarily given permanently. They're not necessarily features that the internet will always have. They are just the consequences of a particular internet design. And because that design is just the design of a computer system or a particular network, that design could be different. And so we have to be careful not to look at a particular design to see the way the network is and believe that we know something about the way the network will always have to be. We can't engage in what I call a kind of is ism that says, here's the way the internet is, and therefore here's the way the internet will always be, because that way of thinking will mislead us about the potential for the internet either to solve some of these problems of regulation or to enable commerce to engage more easily in commerce. Because as the architecture of the internet changes, or what I call the code of cyberspace changes, then those changes can change the 
consequences that I described that the internet has. So for example, as governments or the laws and the market or commerce change the relative anonymity of cyberspace through technologies such as this technology here, cookies, um, we will see changes in the consequence of what markets and governments can do. So for example, think about the way the cookies technology interacted with the internet. Um, originally, uh, the internet was designed so that it was very difficult for those engaged in transactions on the internet to know who and what people were trying to do at the other end of the network. So for example, the original architecture of the internet uh, made it so that when you went with a browser to a website, that was a stateless transaction, meaning that the web server had no automatic way to know who you were, and therefore no way automatically to know that you were the person who was there five minutes ago, or you were the person who was looking at a different book on a different page of the website. This stateless architecture, of course, protected relative anonymity, but the problem was that it made it hard for the technology to enable the web server to track the desire of customers to, for example, consume or purchase items. And so to respond to this particular problem, what the designers of early net architecture did was to develop a technology which we have called cookies to enable the website to track what people are doing within the context of the website. And they do that by just allowing the web server to deposit or mark a bit of data on the client or the browser side of the web transaction. And so what that means is when you go to the Amazon website, the Amazon website will take um, a bit of information and place it on your browser's computer on the hard disk and so that when you move around the website, the web server has a way of knowing you are the person who was just looking at a particular book and you're the person who's now looking at the new book. And more importantly, it gives the web server a simple way to know that when you say, I want to buy 15 copies of a particular book, when you go to the checkout counter, you are remembered as the person who bought 15 copies of a particular book. So this is a technology originally designed to make it easy to engage in the transactions associated with uh, engaging in commerce on the web, and that was its original objective. Now that objective was a good one, and it was extremely important that the internet enable that if the internet was going to be a technology to facilitate lots of growth and lots of commerce. But the important point to recognize is that that small change in the design of the network had a very important consequence to the relative anonymity of people behaving in the network because it made it much easier for computers on the network to begin to monitor behavior of people on the network because we now had a relatively automatic way to identify people and to track what they do, at least within the context of a particular website. Think about a second technology that also has this effect, what we can call sniffer technology. As I said, the internet cuts everything into packets, and these packets are spewed out onto uh, the network. And the packets are ordinarily uh, just considered uh, by examining the header on the packet, which means just examining the address information about where the packet's coming from and where it is intended to go. Nobody uh, in the original design here was looking beyond that particular bit of header information, and the consequence of that, I said, was that it was hard to know what was going on inside the packet. But there's no reason why you couldn't build technology to begin to look inside the packet, and therefore, technology to make it easier to identify what, in fact, the packet is a packet of. And so the sniffer technology is technology to capture packets or make copies of packets as it goes across the network and examine the contents of the packets 
and based upon the types of applications that run in the network, make a fairly strong judgment about exactly what the behavior is that's involved with that particular packet of data. So if you're using uh, a Kazaa file server to serve peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, music across the internet, packet sniffers would make it uh, possible to identify the particular packet of data, which might be one tiny chunk of one small song being sent across the internet, as a packet of data associated with a peer-to-peer -peer client, and therefore make it possible for the website owner, I'm sorry, for the network owner, to enforce a policy about whether the network can be used for that particular type of uh, data. Uh, so this sniffer reveals the information that this packet is uh, containing data from an MP3, and if the network owner, for example, at a university doesn't want to permit MP3 traffic on the network, that packet can then be discarded. Finally, think about the problem of knowing where someone comes from. If this is a graphical representation of what the internet is, um, we can begin to develop databases that try to map the IP addresses, which I said before were not necessarily tied to any geography, to a particular list of the actual locations that those IP addresses are associated with. So we can take the list of IP addresses and begin to build a table that makes IP addresses effectively identifiable at a geographical, at a geographic uh, uh, level so that we know where it's most likely that data or individuals on the network are actually located when they're engaging in behavior on the network. These maps facilitate a kind of IP mapping, the IP mapping making it easy for us to know that an IP address, for example, this IP address of 162.4623.1 comes from New York City, and then governments can decide whether to permit behavior or not on the basis of where the IP address indicates the packet is going or where the packet is coming from. Now, when you think about these three changes, each of them in some sense small changes, none of them requiring massive reconstructions of the original internet, you can see that each of them makes it easier to know who somebody is on the network. That's what the cookies technology does. What they're in fact doing on the network, that's what the packet sniffing technology does. And where in fact they are on the network, which makes it easier to uh, enforce rules that are geographically specified. All three of these changes in the technology, each of them relatively small, radically to get, uh, change, when you think about them together, the relative anonymity of life on the internet. So the internet might have been born in this, as this space, where anybody could behave and do things without fearing the government or commercial entities could know much about you or what you were doing. But what we've seen over the last 15 years of the internet's development is an increasing development of technologies that sit on top of the internet in some important sense, architectures, which modify the original architecture of the internet in some uh, relevant sense, to change the relative anonymity from relative anonymity to relative identifiability. So this relatively anonymous internet becomes relatively identified and the unregulable internet becomes regulable. So these changes have consequences. One consequence is that there's more commerce enabled on the internet. But another consequence is that there's more opportunity for governments to control behavior on the internet. And this connection between commerce and control is an important link in understanding how we should predict the evolution of the internet to continue. So that's the conclusion of the first important point to recognize about how the internet will evolve. How it was is not a prediction about how it will be. Isism is the mistake of confusing a particular architecture with the necessary design of the internet in the future. And rather than taking for granted a particular design, we should decide whether we like the design or don't like the design for other independent reasons unrelated to 
the original decisions of those who designed the internet. The second point is that the changes that one might impose through this picture of the law as uh, interaction between four different modalities of regulation are themselves interrelated. That the four modalities interact with each other and that more regulation in one context might mean less regulation from another of these four uh, modalities or alternatively less regulation from one context might mean more regulation from another. So for example, let's think about a particularly ugly example uh, which is spam. When the internet was first popular for those who would use it for email in the old days, there were very strong norms against advertising both in spaces like Usenet discussion groups uh, and in internet uh, email. So those norms, we can imagine, formed a protective barrier around the original target of regulation here, this red dot, and those norms kept the level of unsolicited commercial speech down. But as the network changed by having new people brought onto the network who weren't themselves normed into behaving in this particular way, we might say as America Online came onto the network, these norms began to dissolve so that one couldn't rely upon the behavior or norms of other people on the internet to keep unsolicited commercial email down. So that meant norms were no longer a protection, and in their place then, people began to develop other protections to protect people from the burdens of unsolicited commercial email. Well, one uh, protection that was developed in response to the expanding spam uh, problem, which was predictable given the market incentives to spread spam, was an architectural solution, which was brought about by net vigilantes. And by vigilantes, I don't mean to be pejorative about those people. They are people who are trying to protect people from unsolicited commercial email in a context where there is no good law. So this is vigilante in the best sense of the term, but they are people who are taking, in a sense, the law into their own hands. And what these people did was begin to develop architectures that would enable uh, people who ran email servers or people who got email to filter or to block email that uh, was unsolicited or likely to be spam. So that meant that architecture was competing with the market in this graphical representation to protect the uh, individuals against the burdens of spam. But those architectural solutions themselves impose cost on other people's ability to use email in the simple way in which it was originally designed. In particular, let's go back to our first uh, character, John Gilmore. John Gilmore uh, was somebody who uh, uh, believed very much that the internet uh, would remain open and free from regulation of the government because of the architecture guaranteeing that that freedom would continue to be built into the network. But John Gilmore, a strong believer in civil liberties, also believes that email servers ought to be set up such that people are free to relay email through his server if they're trying to protect their anonymity, for example, if they're trying to criticize a government or criticize their employer. So John Gilmore ran email servers that would allow people this type of freedom, yet he was required, because of the architecture of access to broadband, to contract with a particular broadband company to get the right to connect to the internet. Well, that broadband company didn't like his particular system for protecting against spam, and so the broadband company began to prohibit John Gilmore from developing and pr providing the service he was providing because it interfered with the broadband company's view of the proper way to protect people from spam. So that meant that John Gilmore's freedom to build out a service that was uh, valuable in his view to the free speech of uh, internet was restricted by this war that was going on to save the world from the consequences 
of spam. Now, the point to see here is that that particular conflict is the result of a very predictable interaction between the disappearance of norms and the strong incentives to develop uh, market ways, cheap ways to advertise, and the predictable technological response to those cheap ways to advertise. And I want to use the example to suggest that we think about alternatives to this particular solution to the spam problem, which might take advantage of the interaction between these different modalities in a more effect effective way. So here again is the picture of the world governed by spam solutions that are primarily architectural. The idea here is to use the law as a way to reduce the need for architecture or technical solutions to the spam problem, and therefore to simultaneously restrict the burden that spam is imposing on others uh, by using incentives created through the law to substitute for the type of controls that are built into the technology. And the intuition, point two, second important lesson of this lesson on regulation, is that the relationship between the need to use architecture to regulate to achieve a certain end and the law is interactive. One technology might be unnecessary if there were an effective law, or uh, an effective law, put differently, might make irrelevant or unnecessary many technologies or many norms that would be used otherwise to protect people from the burdens of spam. So let's think about the lessons that this uh, lecture on uh, regulation has been intended to convey. The first critical lesson is that we thinking we who think about the internet have got to recognize that the technology of the internet, the architecture of the internet, or the code of the internet, is in an important sense like law. The code is law. It builds into its design certain freedoms and certain possibilities. And those freedoms and possibilities and also constraints determine in a large, uh, to a large degree how people can interact in this space. Not completely. I'm not suggesting that there's any necessary or tight connection between particular designs and particular behaviors, but that it, it's like stairways or bridges on a highway or boulevards in Paris, becomes an extremely important aspect of how behavior in this space is or will be regulated. The second important point is that this architecture or code is not given to us by nature. This architecture or code is plastic. It is bendable or changeable and will be changed as particularly powerful interests, whether the government or commerce, uh, desire and affect that change. That sometimes, number three, because of the interaction between one modality and another, the interaction between architecture and law or architecture and the market, the law is actually helpful to avoid regulations by another modality that might turn out to be bad. So, for example, the absence of any legal regulation in the context of spam creates an incentive for code regulation in the context of spam. And that code regulation turns out to be very burdensome to email and therefore might be thought to be bad regulation to control for spam. So this is the third lesson. No law can beget bad code. And the fourth lesson is that good law can sometimes avoid bad code, meaning good law can sometimes make unnecessary or eliminate any incentive to produce technologies which are attempting to serve the same policy objective, but uh, which cannot as well achieve that policy objective. That's the hope, that good law can avoid bad code. But the important lesson that the original libertarians in cyberspace taught us is something we should not forget here either, 
that in a context as new and as vibrant as cyberspace, the possibility of the law regulating uh, effectively and smartly uh, is uh, um, uh, undermined by the extraordinary amount of ignorance that typically defines legislators as they think about something technological like the internet. So while there is an important lesson to be learned about the smart ways in which law and technology might interact, the bottom line important lesson to remember is that there is a good reason to be skeptical that legislators will in fact understand the smart lesson well enough so that they don't use their power in regulating the space in a way which would in fact simply weaken or destroy the great opportunities that the internet might produce. So this has been a lesson about the way in which the law might interact with the internet through an understanding of regulation that tries to focus our attention a little bit more broadly than simply upon the law's direct regulation of individuals, but instead of on the law's ability to use its power to both change individual behavior but also to change the behavior of norm uh, effects through regulation or market effects through regulation or the effect of architecture. The objective of any modern analysis of regulation must be to consider how these four modalities function together. And they function together, not necessarily perfectly and certainly not with great insight, but they function together in a way that will directly impact the freedom or opportunities that individuals have. And for those who are interested in preserving certain freedoms or preserving certain opportunities, understanding that interaction becomes crucial. Thank you very much.